right, so I'm going to talk about, about, about stigma, okay? And not only am I going to talk about stigma, but I'm going, ah, now, oh, there, okay. Um, so there's a famous uh, American uh, short story by the uh, author Nathaniel Hawthorne, right, called The Scarlet, the Scarlet Letter. Um, and this is a, uh, a, a, a picture taken of, uh, from that film, is still from that film, um, the, the first four or five times it's been filmed. And the story of, of, of The Scarlet Letter is that a, 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 uh, um, a woman is, uh, a young woman is married to a sailor who goes off to sea for many years. And uh, while he is gone, she engages in an adulterous affair and has a baby. Um, and the story itself is concerned. Um, and, and of course, this being a Puritan community in colonial New England, she is stigmatized by her community. And um, the, uh, the story itself is a, is a story of the consequences of that stigmatization, both for her and for the community in which she lives. Um, stigma is, um, uh, is a... Uh, um, one of the mechanisms, um, maybe even uh, uh, one of the, the most central mechanisms uh, by which social norms are enforced, right? That we have, we, we, we imagine normative behavior, we imagine behaviors that we, we like and those are fine, behaviors that we don't like if people engage in behaviors that we think are bad, we, we stigmatize them in various ways, right? Now stigma actually is not just restricted to um, to behaviors, that is, we don't just stigmatize behaviors. Lots of things in society are stigmatized, um, and not just not just choices, but also characteristics as well. Glenn has written very eloquently on this, um, and uh, I found this. Uh, I, I like your book a lot, and I, I think that everybody here should read it. Um, and it's not long, so you have no excuse, right? Uh, <laughs> so. Um, uh, um, but I'm going to be talking about, about, about um, uh, stigmatizing uh, uh, behaviors. And to set this in some context, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, think about crime. And what I'm interested in um, is not the microdynamics of stigmatization, not how it is that, that people become stigmatized and unstigmatized. Um, I'm also not going to talk about the question that I think is the most interesting, which is how is it, what is the social mechanism or the set of social mechanisms that determine what kinds of things are stigmatized and what kinds of things are not, okay? Um, but what I'm going to talk about are the dynamics. This is the kind of, I think, the, the first question that one has to ask, but it's not the most interesting question, and this is maybe my central problem with this paper. Um, it's the first question that one has to ask about stigma, just if you have some kind of stigmatic process going on, um, how does it, how does it, um, uh, uh, how does it work in the community? Um, now, um, the interesting thing about, about I, 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 I chose to think about crime because um, I'm interested in, 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 not just in, as I said, not just in the dynamics of stigma itself, but more generally about, about how it is that the attribute, you know, social meanings get, get attributed to particular acts. Um, and uh, so much has been written, or at least not much, but so many, there are some, some very interesting papers that have been written in the legal literature on the interaction between, between law and social norms. And, um, uh, and it's, pointed, it's been pointed out in the literature that, that one of the things that law does, aside from saying, here are bad acts and here are penalties that you're going to, to face, in addition, law actually creates social meaning because it's a public announcement right, that says that this is a bad act. Right? And that our, you know, our representatives, our congressmen, our, our whatever, right? our, our legislatures, we, we, we have these public decision-making mechanisms that essentially announce these kinds of behaviors are out of bounds. They're socially out of bounds. And, um, uh, and uh, on the other hand, and there's, there's documentation on this, that, um, that when laws are passed that run across or try to contradict prevailing social norms, um, um, uh, the law is often disrespected, and so um, some scholars, in particular Larry Lessig, has, has written on this. It says that you have to be careful in passing laws because, on the one hand, laws can reinforce social norms that are already present, okay? But on the other hand, obeying the, the law itself is, in fact, a social norm, right? And if we pass lots of laws that run counter to prevailing social feelings, then in some sense, we, we, he didn't use this word, but you could say it stigmatizes the law. It, it demeans the law, devalues the law, 
Okay. Um, very interesting point that um, uh, a lawyer named uh, uh, Daniel Cahan wrote um, was the following. He said that uh, we have, you know, in the economics literature, there's this, this conventional understanding that says that uh, um, it might be more efficient um, to have harsher penalties than it is to have high probabilities of apprehension because, you know, searching out people who are committing crimes, that's a really expensive thing to do. Uh, but in fact, in an, if, if we imagine expected utility maximizing criminals, if we jack up the cost of committing a crime and being caught, we can lower the probability right, of catching someone, have the same expected value, and uh, consequently not change the incentive at all, but it might be cheaper to have a harsher penalty for the few people we catch than for the many, um, um, than for having these big gigantic police forces that are out there all the time catching people. And, and, uh, and, and Kahan points out that um, um, on the contrary, um, uh, well not on the contrary, but, but, but he uh, makes the observation that if in fact we have a crime uh, which is sitting there and on the books and it has harsh penalties, but if we don't enforce it very much, Right? That's what it means to say that we're going to lower the apprehension probability, that we don't enforce it very much. Then we're really saying this crime is not important. Okay? Um, and so um, uh, to the extent that, that if we say that it's not important, we say that it's not such a bad, what we're really saying is it's not such a bad thing if you do this crime. Right? And consequently, um, um, this diminishes the social incentive not to commit the crime. Okay, so we're going to imagine that there's both the direct criminal incentive and then also the social incentive. And um, although the traditional point is correct um, within its own model, right, for uh, talking about the criminal penalty or the effective criminal penalty, what we'll call the direct penalty, the, um, uh, uh, the, the apprehension probability has something to do with the social penalty by changing the social meaning of what it does, of what it, of what it means to, to commit this particular act. And I suppose that everybody in this room is familiar with the Haifa daycare experiment, right? Um, which is an example, right, of where social meanings uh, were actually changed. And the interesting thing to me about that was that um, uh, at the end of the experiment, or, or I guess actually it was about a little more than two-thirds of the way through the experiment when... Uh, um, uh, when they uh, they took what the six out of ten daycare centers that were facing the uh, that that had the the uh, the fine and they removed the fine, the centers did not revert to the to the old equilibrium, and I and I and I and, and of course this being an Israeli society when at some point someone must have shook their fist and said, you you've got to stop being uh, late right I mean that was how it must have worked, um, but uh, um, but it didn't revert right so so that 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 putting putting things into the um, you know, into the market change social meanings. And, uh, um, and of course, uh, the social meaning of market in general have been um, uh, a subject of much, much discussion. I suppose that many people have here have read, in here have read some of the work of uh, Michael Sandel on, on, on how markets uh, um, uh, influence um, uh, the way that we understand particular kinds of actions. Um, and this is stuff that I'm really interested in, and this paper is a first attempt to um, to see what the consequences of social meanings actually are. Um, so if we think about, about um, uh, uh, social influence and crime, we know that there are lots of criminal activities that are essentially social activities. Uh, I've listed a couple of uh, here. Um, you know, it, uh, there's been a, a much discussion in the, in, the, in the criminology literature on juvenile crime, um, and it seems that there's a very strong social component to it. One finds, if you look at, um, um, at um, uh, social network analyses of juvenile activity, you see that there are a lot of strong peer effects that are going on here. Uh, this is no surprise to anybody in the room. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, social influence is an important part of the, uh, of the uh, um, of the criminal story and doesn't need much motivation. So I want to talk about how, how social influence actually works. Um, uh, so when I use the phrase social influence, I'm thinking about, about social incentives for conforming behavior. Um, and uh, there are four stories that, uh, um, that I can think about, that I've thought about, that, uh, um, that are popular, I suppose, when one, when among people who write on, uh, on, on social influence. Um, I've listed uh, three, um, what I might call the rationality of conformism, and I don't, and, and, and I, I shouldn't use the word rationality. I suppose what I'm thinking about here is conformism as being instrumental, 
Okay? Not having a value in itself, but it being in instrumental in some way. So for example, conformism comes about because, because there's some commonality among us all and we learn things from each other. That's a social learning story, right? Um, and there are lots of models of that out there in the literature. Um, reputation, right, is another, is another source of conformism, right? We have uh, uh, um, everything you want to know about reputation, I suppose, is in the Maylath and Samuelson book on the topic, right? And uh, uh, on, on, on reputation as an instrumental thing. Um, and here the idea is, is that, is that, is that uh, um, in a world of incomplete contracting, reputation Having a good reputation enables you to achieve certain kinds of things. And you manipulate your reputation to get into situations where you can really run it down, for instance. Um, and uh, so this is a dynamic game story. Um, stigma is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and then, of course, conformity could not just be instrumental, but it could be um, valuable in itself. Um, and uh, so I spent some time thinking about whether these models are observational, these different stories are observationally distinguishable um, um, at the level of looking at um, distributions of behavior within a population. Okay? I suspect that, that if one uh, uh, went down to the level of brain scans, these things might well be um, observationally distinct. Um, but I think with the kind of data that, that many sociologists and economists get to look at, I'm convinced um, that they, it would be very difficult to distinguish these, 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 these four different stories. Um, and, um, uh, and I have a whole wrap on that that I will not go into now. Um, uh, and so um, uh, what I'm going to do is to focus on the dynamics of stigma. Of, I'm going to tell a story about stigma and I'm going to talk about a dynamic process where there is some social cost to engaging in some activities. Um, and I'm going to interpret this as a stigma cost. But one can imagine other kinds of models, um, uh, other kinds of stories that would lead to very similar kinds of dynamics. Okay. Um, all right. So now let's talk about, about I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, and what time, Rachel, do I go to? I go to uh, 11 noon. noon. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the, I set my watch the wrong way. I seem to be on mountain time. <laughs> um, coming from Ithaca, that's quite an achievement. Okay. Um, um, right, okay. Yeah, it's, it's good to be in the right time zone. All right, so let me just mention, um, what do I mean by, 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 by stigmatization? Um, and um, uh, uh, this is a distillation of... Um, um, I suppose at least one strand of, uh, of, 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 of thinking about stigma by social psychologists, um, that there are, are, are distinct behaviors or attributes among individuals, um, and dominant cultural beliefs, we're gonna, there is such a thing as dominant cultural beliefs, and they, they link um, uh, uh, people who have uh, undesirable characteristics um, are stereotyped in some kind of negative way, um, and, uh, and then they are treated as, 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 as an other, right, uh, by, by, um, uh, by dominant cultural beliefs um, or people holding dominant cultural beliefs. Um, and then um, there are various ways in which socially that we will treat this other as different from ourselves. Um, this is the stigmatic process. And these individuals consequently experience status loss, discrimination, um, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is, this is kind of a, um, uh, a breakdown of how, how, how stigma actually works. Now, I'm actually not going to model the, or talk about at all the, the, the process of how stigmatization actually happens. I'm just going to say that, that, that people are going to get stigmatized, right? And I think there's some very interesting stories about thinking about what might be going on underneath that and, and, and how, those, how that process might be disrupted um, in, um, um, in socially useful ways. Um, but that's not the subject of this talk. So here's the story now, I'm, and I'm now going to um, turn to my model and describe um, um, what, um, let me see where I am here. Um, I'm going to turn to my model and I'm going to describe um, uh, the stigmatic story that uh, that uh, I want to um, uh, that I want to tell. Um, okay. Oh, there's one thing I guess I want to say first. So let me let me let me um, go back and say one previous thing. Um, 
in thinking about, about social influences. You know, when one reads the uh, social psychology literature, right, the first thing you notice is that social psychologists and economists have very different categories, right, for talking about things. And, and um, uh, there are two things that, that, that um, an economist can do if you want to think about social psychological phenomena. You can actually try and model um, using um, social psychological categories, right? Or alternatively, what you can try and do is to reinterpret um, the categories of the social psychologists in a, um, um, in, in, into economic categories, right? And so I am going to um, uh, uh, do the latter because at the end of the day, I want to have a paper that economists can read. Uh, and, so, um, uh, and so what are those categories? Um, there are, in fact, two ways, I think, uh, that, um, uh, um, that, social influences, that social influence can work when we think about this in terms of, of economic categories. Um, so when we think about economic categories, there are two things that essentially affect behavior um, uh, in the uh, dominant decision theoretic paradigms. Uh, we have preferences and beliefs, and these things are distinct. We have tastes on the one hand, and we have beliefs about what's going to happen on the other hand, or, or what is happening on the other hand, um, and then those interact in some way. And of course, um, you see this in the expected utility uh, framework, right, where we have probabilities on the one hand, and then we have a payoff function on the other, and then we expect payoffs of acts with respect to um, probabilities and preferences, and, 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 and beliefs are supposed to be um, distinct things. Um, uh, and um, so, uh, for instance, uh, uh, when we think about uh, um, social influence in fashion, this is really something that is, that is um, influencing preferences, right? Um, the tastes are, are, are being socially influences, uh, influenced. On the other hand, um, there are lots of social situations um, in which it's beliefs that are being, um, uh, uh, being uh, influenced. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and sometimes, of course, they, they spill over. But, you know, for example, um, why is it that, uh, uh, that, uh, that prediction markets seem to work well? Um, prediction markets seem to work well. Um, it's been argued by um, um, some people, in particular by Justin Wolfers, is because prediction markets aren't asking you how you are going to vote, for example, in some election. They're asking how you think other people are going to vote. They're actually, they're actually um, uh, 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 looking for different information. And, um, uh, and um, I mentioned Justin Wolfers because he has shown that uh, he's done some empirical work that, that, uh, that has found that if you ask people um, in surveys how they think other people are going to vote as opposed to who are you going to vote for, the surveys that ask the first question actually are, are more accurate than the who are you going to vote for surveys, and they're about as accurate as prediction markets are. Um, uh, there is um, an interaction between how you think other people are going to vote and how you yourself are going to vote. Um, there's a fascinating book um, by a political scientist um, who actually was associated with the University of Chicago off and on for many years and actually studied in Bonn. And this is Elizabeth Noel Neumann. You know this name? Um, and she wrote a book called The Spiral of Silence. Um, uh, and she had this very interesting finding where she was... Uh, uh, asking people um, uh, how they were going to, um, uh, this is preceding some, 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 some uh, a German parliamentary election, um, and she asked people questions about both how they were going to vote and who they thought was going to win. And what she discovered in what was a very tight race, right, was that, was that uh, and, and opinions were fluctuating back and forth, is that when she went back and sampled people again and again and again repeatedly, um, that uh, a leading indicator of how they were going to vote, right, a leading indicator of how they were going to vote was who they thought was going to win. Okay, um, so that um, people would say, uh, I'm going to vote for X, but I think X is, and I think X is going to win. I'm going to vote for X, and I think X is going to win. I'm going to vote for X, and I think Y is going to win. I'm going to vote for Y, right? Um, and here we have this, this, this um, um, uh, uh, sort of about beliefs actually leading taste. And you could imagine building a model that would, that would capture that kind of thing in a, in a, in a social learning model. Um, and one could also imagine modeling this in several different ways. But the point is, is, that, is, that, is that social influence works through beliefs um, at least as much as through um, 
uh, as through uh, 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 as through tastes. Uh, Larry Bartels has a book on, on American presidential elections, which has similar similar kinds of findings about the importance of beliefs um, uh, for funding cycles. Um, and so I want to I want to emphasize that that um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to treat these social psychology categories very badly by just mapping them in a very crude way into an economic story. Um, and, uh, and then, um, uh, and then um, uh, kind of doing game theory with that. Uh, all right, so what's my model? Um, so I'm going to imagine, uh, I'm, 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 as I said, I'm going to think about crime. Um, and I'm going to imagine that uh, individuals, we have a large population of individuals, and these individuals are going to have opportunities every now and then to commit crimes. So I'm going to imagine that uh, criminal opportunities arrive in some random fashion, some exogenous way. Um, and these different uh, criminal opportunities have, have uh, different uh, rewards for their successful completion. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the jewels if I break in and I, into the jewelry store. Or I'm going to uh, um, get a little more money if I cheat on my taxes, whatever it is that we're, that we're talking about. Um, and uh, uh, if, uh, uh, so if the, if the uh, individual gets away with the crime, um, you know, they get this reward. But if they don't get away with the crime, um, they're caught. If they're apprehended, um, then they uh, pay some immediate penalty. Um, and you might think about this as going to jail or paying a fine or something like that. And then in addition, they are tagged, right? Um, they're stigmatized in some way. Their name goes on a web page or their name is published in the newspaper. Um, in, my, in, my, uh, in my hometown, the newspaper publishes every week a list of who is, you know, who is, who is arrested for driving under the influence, right? And it's interesting to look at the list and see if any of your colleagues are on it, you know? Um, so... Um, this is the, uh, um, uh, the kind of thing I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and as long as this individual is tagged, suppose that you have committed a crime and you have been tagged. Um, and I'm going to suppose um, that, uh, uh, that being tagged in this way, being labeled as a criminal, being labeled as a drunk driver, is something that stigmatizes you. And so you're going to be... You're going to be um, uh, you're going to have to pay some kind of cost for that. And, and, and I could tell you, I could stand up here for an hour and tell you stories about, about different ways in which this is done in different societies, right? But there are, um, uh, in, 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 in some way, um, uh, I'm just going to um, not go into that, and I'll just say that, uh, um, that as, long as, you're as long as you're stigmatized, as long as you're wearing this tad we tag, we can think of you as having the scarlet A, on your, on your breast, as does the uh, protagonist of Nathaniel Hawthorne's story, um, you're going to be uh, 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 treated in some way that basically gives you a utility cost. However, um, uh, that utility cost is going to depend upon how many other people are being tagged. So for example, um, um, if, uh, if, if, if everybody in the community is an adulterer. It's hard to imagine that any one adulterer is going to be stigmatized for being an adulterer, right? And on the other hand, if nobody in the community is adulterer, and then we, we go out and, and put the scarlet A on someone's breast, we will imagine that they, they will be um, uh, stigmatized. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the penalty for being, for, for, for being stigmatized for this particular act depends um, on how many people, other people are stigmatized as well, right? And, and um, uh, if too many people are stigmatized in this way, then gee, it's, there's, not, there's not, not, much stigma, so not much of a stigma cost associated with this. On the other hand, if this is a, you know, it's a bad act that everybody does and you got caught, fine, okay. Um, on the other hand, uh, um, if, it's, if it's something that rarely happens, if few people are in fact labeled, then the, label, the cost of the label is much more severe. And I'm taking that as an axiom. Of, of, of this paper. It would be interesting to um, uh, derive um, um, a, uh, 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 that kind of consequence from more, some more primitive assumptions. Um, uh, Jean Tirole actually sent me a paper some years ago, having read this, a, a previous version of this paper, where he suggested a model where that could, in fact, take place. And I haven't, I haven't actually worked that out yet, um, because it was hard to take that and put that into this dynamic story. But I think that that's a very interesting issue. Um, so individuals, going on with my story, individuals remain tagged for a random amount of time. Um, and this, again, is another exogenous feature of the model. Um, and then individuals are untagged. Then the stigma is removed. Question? Yeah, so what happens if you commit a crime while you're tagged? Are there any incentives for you to not commit a crime? Once you're tagged? 
Yeah. Well, there's still the immediate direct cost of, uh, of uh, you know, being caught. If, so, so once tagged, do I commit another crime? That's your question, right? And, and there still remains a penalty, right, which is that if you get caught, you still pay a direct cost. That will always, so you can always go to jail a second time. But the yeah. cost is lower anyhow, right? Well, I'm, I, in, in. The in, of being tagged, uh, or, that's yeah. the question, right? The incentive to commit yeah. a crime is higher. Con conditional on being tagged, the incentive to commit a crime will be, will be higher because you've already, you are already bearing the stigma so cost. But there is, but, but it is not, it does not make you commit every crime that comes down. And, and, and. And that's um, um, and we'll see that that actually leads to an interesting trade-off in the model in a little bit. So so there still will be an incentive. I mean, it's a it's a model assumption essentially, right? You could have different tags, right? You're bad or really bad, like you know, yes. Or another so thing, right? The, the tagging is prolonged, right? The right. Negotiation starts right. later if you commit a crime mm. twice. So you're assuming you're either tagged or not. In condition of being tagged, that's right. A crime again is not. You, you, you don't get right. You don't get you don't get a, a, a second stamp on, on, on the head. Now you might ask what would happen if I did that, okay? Added a, a, a second tag, right? So you could be a bad guy, like a bad guy or a really so we'll keep it at two tags. And I and, and I think that the, the, the story of the model does uh, the story changes of course, but the but the analysis of the model doesn't change much. And I think and 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 um, um, I'm happy to argue that at the end of the talk. All right, so I think that if, if we could imagine that there were some small finite number of stigma levels, you could be a bad guy, you could be a, you'd be a pretty bad guy, you could be a bad guy, you could be a really bad guy, you could be a hardened criminal type, and you move through these different levels, right, um, the, the essence of the story doesn't change. So this is kind of a, a simplicity assumption, but you could argue, in fact, that, that maybe I have this wrong. But I, I, I don't think I do. Yes? Does it change the probability that you're being caught once you're tagged? Because you might think that once you can identify a criminal, that that could actually... Right. I have not... I, that's an interesting thing to think about. I have not, I have not done that. Um, um, uh, and, and I guess with the NSA being the way it is, we should all be thinking about that, right? Because uh, <laughs> our ability to follow anybody is, is not very good. Uh, so I, I, I have loved, So I'm assuming that, that, that um, being caught... Um, and, and it doesn't change any of the direct penalties. It also doesn't change the set of criminal opportunities that you're going to face in the future. You might imagine that once you're known as someone, for example, who deals drugs, right, this might give you more opportunities for dealing in the future, right? Or you might imagine, that in fact, that if you, if you go to prison, um, you learn um, certain criminal skills, right, um, uh, which would, again, change the reward distribution. So I'm going to assume that both the reward distribution and the direct cost, right, is going to, um, is going to remain the same whether, you're, 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 uh, uh, whether you've been uh, caught out once or not, okay? And the decision context is one dimension. Pardon me? The whole decision context is one dimension in the sense there's only one crime, one type of crime. I mean, yeah, yes. I mean, you could have multiple Yes, I, I, I could make this model arbitrarily complicated. <laughs> yes, that's right. I'm assuming here that there's a, that the, uh, I, I, the story, well, I, I actually don't talk much about crimes. There is a distribution. As I said, every, every criminal opportunity comes with a reward, and different criminal opportunities have different rewards. And what I'm going to assume is that, is that so here's an alternative way of, of describing a model that is the same. Okay? Um, I might assume that there are different kinds of crimes out there, and, um, and uh, these different crime, uh, opportunities for crime A arrive at one rate, opportunities for crime B arrive at another rate, um, and, the, and each of these crimes have different rewards. So there are multiple crimes out there, okay? Um, and then uh, you get one of these things, and, and, uh, and then you decide, you decide what to do. That is, is, if you work the mathematics of that in the way that I'm going to set it up, that's formally the same as saying a criminal opportunity arrives, and when it arrives, you reach into the urn, and you draw to see whether it's A or B. All right. So in the world that I'm going to talk about, those give the same the same mathematics. Now, where they um, 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 where they might where they, so so that doesn't matter. But where they they if you were to consider multiple crime types a little more seriously, where it would make a difference is that is that multiple crime types might carry different stigma penalties. Right. It's one thing to be caught for you know on cheating for taxes. It's another thing you know. Uh, to be caught for spouse abuse or drunk driving or you know so on and so forth, right? So um, 
another dimension in which the model could be enriched would be by having different stigma penalties for different crimes. Okay, um, but if you had us and 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 again, I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. Um, um, I'll, that's enough. <laughs> I, I think I don't have more to say on that. Um, yeah, so this is a really a, a you know, uh, I'm, I'm a theorist. I abstract away from everything, right? Okay. Um, what about multiple audiences for the criminal, wherein tagging might be stigmatizing in the negative sense for an aggregate audience, but it might be uh, honorific? Uh, in, in the so I'm going to come back and I'm, I'm going to come back and talk about that at the end because that that to me is really the um, kind of the, uh, 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 the the key thing here is that is that is that um, I, I'll say it now and then we don't have to say it at the end but I really want to watch my time um, uh, and that is that that um, um, I'm assuming that the community structure is given. So what I'm imagining is that social meanings for acts change, but they change on a, diff a different time scale than the time scale at which people actually think about committing acts and so on and so forth. So I'm imagining that, that, that criminal opportunities come rapidly relative to the rate at which particular kinds of crimes, their stigma costs can be changed, okay? Um, a more important, I think, version of that is that people are always in the process of creating their own communities, right? So um, I might be a good kid in high school, right, and then hang out with the good kids. And then, you know, um, my worldview changes, perhaps because of some exogenous event, not. And what happens is my grades begin to fall and so on and so forth. So what do I do? I find a peer group, right, where, in fact, performance is, in fact, devalued rather than valued, right? And so, and that becomes my reference group, right? So this kind of changing of groups, right, um, uh, I think goes on. And, and, uh, uh, and that's, um, um, and, I, and I think that, it, it, and, it, and it goes at a deeper level. I actually think it has something to do with community creation. And I'll tell you a story about that in just a second. That actually is the big missing piece here in my mind, yeah, right? I think that Absolutely. Stigmatized within my academic community for being pro-life, let's say. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. <laughs> 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 but then I go to church. Right. You know, I mean, I can transfer where I'm getting my sense of social mm -hmm. uh, gratification from, away from mm -hmm. my uh, academic colleagues who are pro-choice, mm -hmm. and uh, over to my Christian mm -hmm. colleagues who are pro-life, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Or I can join the Republican Party. <laughs> Or you can join them both, right? And, and, yeah. <laughs> and display one or the other, right? Oh, I, very hypothetical. Right. <laughs> you know, there, well, you, well, I, you've heard David, David Harris talk about, about the manipulation of, of multiple identities when there are things like racial and ethnic identities, right, among people who have access and how, how people switch back and forth. The same thing must be true with respect to behaviors, right? And, 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 and so I can imagine how you, could, how you can be Republican in one setting and Democratic in another setting. That doesn't, that doesn't seem at all strange to me. There is a, um, uh, uh, and, and, and that kind of community dynamic is the kind of complication that I wanted, that, that's the kind of rich stuff that I want to get to that I haven't been able to get to with this model and is why at the end of the day this is unsatisfactory to me that I really want to talk about how these things go to forming identities. And, and I don't yet know how to do that. Um, uh, there's a, um, a story that I read, and I read this in a book written by the anthropologist Abner Cohen, who some of you might know of. Um, and uh, it, it had to do with, um, with uh, um, Newfoundland, okay? And in, in Newfoundland, uh, I, I think the, uh, the dominant religious group uh, at, at the time that some anthropologist was studying this in the not long after the Second World War was some kind of, you know, a, C of E derivative kind of thing. I'm 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 not up on the on the uh, exactly what it was, but it was uh, um, you know some kind of uh, of um, of uh, uh, Protestant Christian group, right? Um, uh, that was kind of pretty mainstream, all right? And uh, uh, and uh, uh, and then after the war, there was some um, uh, I guess not after early, but in the in the in the 50, late 50s and early 60s, Newfoundland began to have some economic success, and some people got 
became wealthier and they started displaying their wealth. Newfoundland was a traditionally very poor place and it was really hit very hard by the Second World War. They had tremendous, actually both wars, tremendous losses of the male population. Um, so they very, you know, not doing very well for a long time. Then it started to take off and so people started displaying their wealth. They, and how do you do that in Newfoundland? You get a bigger chainsaw, right? You get a bigger snowmobile. And, um, um, and so there began to be these, these, these visible to the community displays of wealth. And at that time, actually, the anthropologist goes on to tell that, that um, uh, um, uh, uh, Baptist ministers, one from one of the Baptist churches, came up and they started having a lot of success. And they started having a lot of success among the poorer part of the Newfoundland community, those who weren't benefiting, um, because, and, and, uh, you know, from this economic growth that was taking place. And within the Baptist community, right, um, there was a norm against displaying wealth, right? So, so um, essentially, you don't have wealth to display. It now becomes attractive to join the community, right? Where it is advantageous not to display your wealth, right? And and this is exactly what this guy wrote about. And and so, um, in a sense, the the and 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 the anthropologist who wrote this went on to argue that this had had something to do with the attraction of the church, right? Aside from whatever doctrinal issues and so on and so forth, um, that this was a place where, where, where the poor could feel at home in a world where divisions were growing in a, from a situation where the divisions weren't existing beforehand. So I think it's a very important story. Um, and now I won't talk about that at the end, because which is, I was going to conclude by talking about that. But as always, you beat me to the punch. Um, and uh, all right, so I'm, now let me describe a formal model very quickly. We're going to have a, a large population, and I'm going to talk about the, uh, the fraction of people at any moment of time who are tagged. Um, this is a model in which people are forward-looking, right? Um, there's a very easy game theory story here in a static model. You commit a crime, you don't commit a crime. If you commit a crime, you're either tagged or untagged. You're either caught or not, um, and, and, and very quickly that leads to a, a coordination game, and then there's multiple equilibria, one where everybody commits a crime, another one where people don't commit crimes. Um, and that's not a very interesting story, and what I wanted to do was to build a dynamic model that actually talked about the dynamics of what it, it, at bottom is basically a coordination game. Um, so, um, and, 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 and my... my um, my starting point for building a dynamic model was looking at the tools that were available from evolutionary game theory, in particular things relating to stochastic best response and stuff like that. Um, but unlike evolutionary game theory, I actually think that the future is important and I wanted individuals to be forward looking. Um, so individuals are going to, um, as I said this is a, at the outset, this is a continuous time model. Um, uh, individuals are going to be thinking about the stigma costs that they're going to bear if they're caught and for how long they're going to bear that. And they also also understand that the stigma cost that they're going to bear is in fact going to fluctuate because if you are in a community where no one cheats on their taxes but a lot of people are beginning to grumble you might in fact cheat on your taxes knowing that if you get caught well maybe I'll be stigmatized at the outset but within a couple of years everyone here is going to be cheating on their taxes and no one's going to care right so there's a dynamic a dynamic uh, uh, feature um, to, to stigma costs. There's going to be a flow cost of stigmatization which depends upon the fraction of people being stigmatized and um, I'm going to normalize the cost by saying that, um, and this is, is just a normalization, to say that, that if everybody is doing this act, if the fraction of people tagged is one, is one then there's no stigma cost. Um, and, um, uh, but on the other hand, if, uh, if n is less than 1, the stigma cost might be higher, right? So you should think about this as a, as a decreasing function, okay. Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. There's no cost in, in stigmatizing. There's no cost to stigmatizing people, right, right. Right, so, so um, yeah. St being mean to people is cheap. <laughs> no, no, I know it's not. Yes. Um, um, and why, I mean, if it's costless, why not stigmatize like hell and then deter anybody from committing a crime altogether? I thought the big puzzle in, say, understanding the evolution or the stability of punishment, say, you know, the evil that is violating social norms, is exactly that, that cost. If it's costless to sanction misbehavior, I don't see why there's any problem to start with uh, in, in 
thinking about how to achieve high cooperation in society. All right. Well, what what um, so. Um, well, there is a problem in re there is a problem in reaching a, a you know you you say well why don't we I mean it implies that there's a collective decision right but in fact stigmatization is 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 a um, you know an individual act I choose to not offer you a job or something some, like some is literally right right, right next door mm -hmm. why should I stand up and tell him look you're not supposed to do that suppose this is costless. Mm -hmm. Punishment would be severe. Many people would easily do it because it is so cheap. Right. If we could observe it. Mm -hmm. So the, the the question that you're asking is essentially why does the function, um, where does the function C come from, right? Okay. Because C is C because 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 at the end of the day there is a process that 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 um, is determining whether or not people are stigmatized, right? And and and. Um, um, and I've made certain I've made certain assumptions about what the of how much stigmatization is going on. What I'm saying here is that no stigmatization goes on if everybody's doing this act. If nobody is doing this act, there's a lot of stigmatization, and it slides down in between. Now, the stigmatization is a consequence of individuals' choices to whether or not to stigmatize in 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 any particular situation. The impact of that in this model is going to be, if I had a model of whether or not to stigmatize, right? if I had a model of the choice of stigmatic act, the end result of that would be something about the shape of the function C. All right? So your question is essentially about where is, the, where is C coming from and why does it look like what it does? Why isn't it, for example, not, not high all the time? Right? And, 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 and I have the cheap answer at this point. Um, which is that since I'm kind of building an aggregate model, I just assumed what the outcome of, of, of a model of the stigmatization process would be. Okay? And I, and, and, and I, I agree that that's a... That, that that's I thought this is the essential question when it comes to understanding how individuals, mm -hmm. as you said, I mean, the, the problem arises because it's individual, it's not collective, mm -hmm. uh, achieve sustainability of cooperation norms, enforcing social norms, etc. I thought the key issue is really why would people ever incur a cost in, in, in So so if if your question is where do social norms come from, that's the key question. Where the content comes but also why people are right. actually willing to spend I agree. Costs I'm I'm but them. I'm asking a different question so that I also think is very important, which is what are the consequences? Okay. Of 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 what are the social no, no, I understand. I right I understand. right so I, I I mean right and 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 um right so maybe you can leave that out for well I'm I'm I I don't want to leave it out but I want to say that 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 the when you're done considering that question right and you want now want to say what does that tell us about the consequences of that question the answer to that question is going to be embedded in C. Okay. At the end of the, that's that's once if we had a, a richer model, what I would do is I would derive C, okay, from some kind of story that would exactly address the question that you're asking. And once I've derived C, then I would carry out the analysis that I have, okay. Um, and and um, I mean, an easy way would be to, to positively stigmatize people who actually enforce norms, right? which is exactly one of the mechanisms. You know, you get a red dot or something if you are cooperating. Society. So you have a positive reputation of gain if you incur the cost to, to sanction someone. So right, and we have a whole host of models that do that, right? So, so um, uh, who is it? Is it is it is it Kandori? I'm thinking of, who has a folk theorem? Yeah, but he's but they they put the red dot for somebody who's. Um, Who's non-cooperated, and then there's right, but they, well, right, but 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 whether it doesn't matter. Everybody is right. Everybody is marked, right? Right. And, so you're, and, you're saying the obverse of somebody. Right, and 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 furthermore, the 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 key idea in all these right. The, right, the key idea in all of these models, and and Joey Deb is one of your colleagues who also has has actually made that model actually work. I guess it's fair to say, and 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 the key idea is not only do you do you do you stigmatize the person who does the bad thing, but you stigmatize the people who don't enforce the stigma, right? And then you stigmatize the people who don't enforce the stigma against the people who don't enforce the stigma, and you do that to the nth degree, right? 
Um, and 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 so that model has been that model has been written down, right, and done. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, again, I'm interested not in where stigma comes from in this paper, but what its consequences are, and the aggregate and the impact of that for my question is going to be what does C look like, right? And so I haven't derived C, okay, um, but um, I think the assumptions that I'm making here are empirically reasonable. Can I ask one other question? Oh. You can well, ask. It's up, it's up to you guys. I mean. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to stop taking a question in... It's up to Larry. Yeah. To Ask it and I might defer it, of course. <laughs> um, so you receive stigma only if you get caught, right? Yes. But, but as far as I understood, there's a formal enforcement of norms, say it's like police or fire. There's also police. And there's the social component. Mm -hmm. But they are attached to each other. So only upon... There has to be discovery, caught. right. Okay. And, and, and again... There could be different processes, right? Well, well... You could have stigma because people know you even without being caught. Sure. But that is, that is one, one Right, right. And, and, and actually, to go back to Glenn's point, um, you could actually get status from not having been caught, right, in a community of criminals, right? So, so yeah, so this is just, all... Just clarification. Yes. It's, it's, it, you, can, you can very quickly take me out of the bounds of feasible I mean, just theory. Just because the timing is so important, right? Like, it could be that, and, and I'm just saying the, the, the dynamics of the social enforcement would be interesting if, if the restriction to... to Right. Right. That that's right. And in fact, and in fact, I'm going to assume that the that the the direct costs um, are essentially, in some sense, born instantaneously. But we know that the you know it could take many years. In the case of white collar crime, for example, to establish whether or not you've actually done anything, but in the meantime, your reputation is ruined or enhanced, depending upon who you hang with, right? Uh, immediately. So, so the timing issues are, are again much more subtle than 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 what this model currently addresses, right? Um, uh, and and at the level uh, for all of these things, when you look at my results at the end, you can then ask the question: If I were to come back and enrich the model in all of these different ways, how would the story differ? Right? So let me just get to the end, and then we'll decide. I, I think that the answers here are, are um, sufficiently plain. They weren't necessarily easy to get to, but they're sufficiently plain that I think that they're quite robust to, to, to modeling choices that I've made. OK. Um, uh, OK. So, so here I'm just kind of describing. Um, uh, I guess th the rest of the story that I told, we have a distribution of rewards, a, a rate of, of criminal <coughs> opportunity arrival. And, and by the way, when I talk about rates, what I'm really imagining is that there's some kind of um, um, uh, a phrase I learned from a mathematician colleague of mine is Poisson alarm clocks. Everybody has, a, has an alarm clock. Um, and uh, it goes off at random moments. And the uh, time between rings is a... Um, Exponent is, is distributed exponentially and independently across rings, um, and this leads to what in the math literature is called a Poisson process. Okay, um, these little alarm clocks go off at random moments, and then you 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 decide what to do. There's a probability of being captured and convicted after committing a crime. Um, there is a utility penalty for being apprehended. Uh, there's an arrival rate of untaggings. Again, there's another alarm clock that will go off, and your your tag is removed. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, I'm going to use this delta as a stand-in for the net direct cost of doing the crime. Okay? And the net direct cost of doing the crime is the reward that you get, or it could be the expected return that you get. Um, well, the way I've chosen this is it's, it's, it's the reward that you get minus the, uh, the expected uh, cost um, of apprehension. And it could be that what happens, are you apprehended, is that you give up your U, and then you also give up um, you know, some more. So V might typically be larger than U, uh, and so on and so forth. Right? I mean, we could, we could, you can do anything you want here. The point is, is, that, is, that, is that the direct rewards are summed up by this number delta, which is a random variable. And, um, uh, uh, and, um, um, and I actually have to talk about Q and V separately because Q, this probability of being captured actually plays multiple roles in the analysis. It's not just summarized by the net direct cost. Um, 
So uh, again, crime opportunities arrive at rate P, tagged individuals are untagged at some rate G. What I'm really interested in is what are the dynamics right, of, of the tagged population? How many people are stigmatized at any time? Is there, is there, are there directions to that flow? What does the long run distribution of stigma actually look like? That's the, those are the questions that I want to ask. Okay? Um, and uh, um, so all of this is set up simply so that I can get to an aggregate process and then talk about that aggregate process and talk about how it changes with respect to the micro determinants uh, that I've just finished describing. So the number of tagged individuals evolves according to a birth death process and um, uh, and a birth death process is just a moment, is, is a, a process where at any given moment um, the variable in question can either remain the same, step up by one, or step down by one. So you have either a single birth or a single death, or it stays the same, and next moment of time, single, either birth, death stays the same. Things change in this, in this kind of one by one way. Okay, so you don't have, this is interesting, you don't have these big, uh, can I put this in my pocket? Okay, so you don't have these big, uh, um, uh, suddenly everybody goes out and commits a crime at the same instantaneous moment. Things, things happen individual by individual. Um, and, um, okay, um, so I'm now going to describe the decision problem that an individual faces, okay? Uh, and, and, and what happens at any, at, at a, when a criminal opportunity arrives for an individual, there it is, there's the plum, there's the big reward sitting there. An individual has to decide whether or not to commit this crime. And the individual, in thinking about this, considers um, uh, on the one hand the reward, and on the other hand the penalty. And of course the penalty has two parts. There's an immediate instantaneous utility hit from getting caught, okay? And then in addition, if you are caught, there is this flow utility cost of being stigmatized for some random amount of time. And not only is it random with respect to the amount of time that you're going to be stigmatized, but the cost that you're going to bear is going to be random as well because it's going to depend at any given moment of time in the future upon how many other people are stigmatized. And you then make a decision. You do the little expected utility calculation and you make a decision and the model advances. That's, that's, that's the story. Everybody happy? Okay. Um, so, uh, how do I describe how individuals behave? Uh, I need a pair of functions, because the answer to this question is going to depend, for reasons that we've already talked about, on whether you're already tagged or not, right? Um, if, you are, uh, um, if you're already tagged, there is no additional, you don't get a second tag, and therefore there is no additional um, uh, uh, stigma cost to bear, but there is still a cost to um, the direct cost of criminal activity. And so that's going to lead to one decision, and that's, that's sigma t. That's what happens if you're tagged. And uh, on the other hand, if you're untagged, you have to think about the social consequences as well. And if we had multiple types of criminals, okay, we would have, have um, uh, uh, different sigmas depending upon what your state is. Are you untagged? Are you uh, uh, kind of a small time guy or are you a serious criminal or whatever, right? We would have multiple tags and then we would have a multi multi-type birth death process and the analysis isn't any more complicated um, than, uh, um, than what I've described so far. All right, so um, a strategy is going to be a pair of functions that is going to describe what you do given the current state of the population. And so what this means is that every individual actually knows um, uh, in some sense, the state of the population. They know how many people are currently tagged, right? And a better model, a richer model would say, you know, what are we, what are we measuring with how many people are currently tagged? We're measuring essentially the, the strength of the stigma at this moment of time. And we might imagine a model where people, um, instead of, 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 of actually knowing how many people are tagged, have some sense that comes from some social process and we could you know, build some kind of signal process into this um, that would make the model um, more complicated. Um, and I played around with that a little bit and all it does is make the, the math a little more complicated but the story seems to be the same. Um, uh, so I'm gonna make this, this what in game theory you'd call a complete information, uh, rather a perfect information assumption a perfect information assumption. Um, 
Uh, so individuals know the population state, and since they know the population state, they know they have a, a, a fix on, on what the process in the future is going to look like. Okay? Um, uh, so, uh, and an individual at any moment in time, when they have this criminal opportunity, they have to decide whether or not to commit a, problem, a crime. And I'm going to, the way I'm going to describe a strategy, it's going to take the current population of state, uh, there's the arrow button, uh, and, oops, or German coming up? <laughs> of course. Um, population, the current population state and the reward from the particular crime opportunity that I'm facing, it's going to map that into a probability that I'm going to commit the crime. So I'm going to allow people to randomize and it, um, uh, as well and for technical reasons. And it turns out that you don't see a lot of randomization in equilibrium, but you need to, to have it there for some reasons I want to talk about. Um, all right, so, so that's the story. So everybody understands that, that the, what you're going to do is going to depend upon the current state of the population, the reward that's in front of you, and your own current state, whether you're tagged or not. Okay. Um, now, um, what do strategies look like? Um, strategies can be anything, right? Um, any assignment of, 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 uh, of u and n to probabilities, uh, or any assignment of probabilities to u and n. But I'm going to be interested in particular kinds of strategies. A strategy is going to, um, I'm going to and, and you can read the slide as fast as I can say it, uh, we're going to be interested in, it's going to turn out that equilibrium will always have the following property. I might as well just say this now. Um, the smaller the fraction of tagged individuals, the lower probability of committing a crime. A strategy with that property is a monotonic strategy. Um, uh, you might expect there to be a threshold reward such that if the reward is big enough in the current population state, you will commit the crime. We call those things threshold strategies. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and then I'm going to be interested in comparing different strategies because at the end of the day I'm going to do some comparative, comparative dynamic exercises. I'm going to change the, the uh, parameters of the model and I'm going to ask how to equilibrium strategies and the distribution of crime and the rate of crime, how do they all change? And um, so I'm going to introduce this notion about one strategy being more criminal than another. And, and, and here's the definition which you can read. Sigma, pri sigma is at least as criminal a strategy as sigma prime uh, if the, um, uh, in every situation the probability of committing a crime under sigma is at least that is under sigma prime. Okay. So equilibrium so 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 um uh, imagine that I allowed equilibria to depend upon the entire past history of the population. Okay? If I allow that there still is a Markov perfect equilibrium. Okay? So you could say that I'm looking at, but, but I want to be careful because I'm not actually doing game theory and I'll explain why I'm not doing game theory in a moment. But if I were, um, uh, if I were, if I were giving this talk to a game theory audience, yeah, I would tell all this stuff about you know, the, the past history and so on and so forth. And then I'd say there's an equilibrium of this type. Okay? Um, but I thought I would short circuit that. Okay. okay. So we are, like, this is going to be a Markov perfect equilibrium. Yeah, except it's actually not even going to be a Nash equilibrium. And I'll explain why in a minute. Okay, um, it's going to be a competitive equilibrium. Okay, um, so we're going to be looking for equilibria which are symmetric in that sense that everybody uses the same strategies. Um, and 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 I have not written down the decision problem of the individual. I think I've not. Let me make sure. Uh, I've not. Um, um, I've not written down the decision problem of the individual because it's a it's just a slide with a lot of math and it's not very helpful. Um, so. What is, every individual, so the key thing here is that you have to forecast what the future stochastic flow of, um, of, uh, of, 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 st of stigma is going to be, of stigma cost is going to be. And um, so um, uh, in an equilibrium, here's the notion of equilibrium, sigma t and sigma u are common, everybody knows what they are. Then given the current state and given the parameters of the model, Everybody knows what the process, I'm going to look at, I am going to look at the process of all of you and ask what is your crime going to be, right? How much criminal activities are going to be in all of you? And I can ask what, you know, um, 
uh, and I can, and that will be a birth death process. Okay, and I can um, uh, then use that birth death process in evaluating right my my um, um, expect you know my own expected utility, and therefore make a decision about whether or not to commit a crime. And my own my own rule then is going to depend upon what you know the, the rule that you're using. Okay, is this clear? Okay, and so. Um, an equilibrium is that if I all assume that you're using a particular strategy for any sigma prime that you might be using, I will be able to solve the decision problem and, and therefore, and out of that decision problem will come my own sigma prime, my own sigma rather, for your sigma prime. Did I say that right? Let me start again. For if you're using strategy sigma prime, my best response will be some strategy sigma and an equilibrium is when sigma prime and sigma are the same. Okay. Now, why is this? It sounds a lot like a, like a Nash equilibrium of some dynamic game, but it's actually not a Nash equilibrium. Okay. And 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 for one simple reason, and that is that if I were really doing Nash equilibrium, what I would do is I would do the kind of the following kind of calculation. I would say if I commit a crime, I am changing the state that Alberto is going to see. Okay. And therefore, Alberto is going to be more likely to commit a crime. You bad guy, okay? And um, uh, and 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 consequently, I would understand that I can manipulate the process that I see going on by my own act, okay? And uh, I think that's fine, and I think that's lovely, and I'm not doing that because I think this is really. I'm thinking of this as being a large population, and so I'm thinking. So my model has it that individuals are just are 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 facing a stigma process of others that they cannot manipulate by their own choice of action. Pardon? And that's what I mean by competitive equilibrium. And, uh, uh, and uh, yeah. And so what, pardon? And it is going to be something with on Ash. Yes, it is. That's right. And uh, um, uh, so, yeah, and if, we did, if we actually did Nash correct, correctly in a large limit, one should be able to prove that. And I haven't proven that. Um, it seemed like nobody does, but it's yeah, I know it's it's um, nobody does, but I think people should, and I and I feel a little, little guilty about this. So I'm gonna I'm, not, I'm red faced, and now I'm moving on. Right. When I actually once described this to your colleague Debraj Ray um, uh, over drinks one day, he 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 said very quickly. He jumped and he said, "Are you doing are you doing Nash or are you taking this as given?" And I said, "Oh, he's going to beat me up because he's a theory guy, you know." And I said, "No, no, I'm I'm not doing Nash." And he said, "Good, all right." So, so I, I'm 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 on a, I think that this is the sensible thing to do. Not only is it sensible, it's the right thing to do. Okay. Um, all right. So I can. So now I said that there is a a a, a this is a birth death process. You can derive from an equilibrium the rate at which the number the rate at which uh, uh, um, new individuals are going to be tagged and the rate at which old individuals are going to be untagged you can compute that from the equilibrium strategy and so you can actually write down what the population birth death process is and here are the formulas which are meaningless in the amount of time we have to stare at them but they're derivable from the strategies okay and now comes the German right all right, and you recognize this, no doubt, right? Um, uh, what does this mean? This says uh, that, that, that once your reputation is ruined, right, um, you can live your life in an unrestrained way, right? Uh, that, that's more or less the essence, right? There, I, there's actually a, um, an, an English version of this that I discovered just recently. Let me see if I can find it. How many of you know who Margaret Mitchell is? You know who Mar well, you live in a part of the world where you should know who Margaret Mitchell is, right? Margaret Mitchell is the person who wrote Gone with the Wind. No, 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 it's American literature. It's <laughs> uh, and, and she said, Margaret Mitchell said, until you've lost your reputation, you never realize what a burden it was or what freedom really is. Okay? Uh, <laughs> I, I, think that the, I think that the German is a little bit better. And the reason, by the way, that I, I, I wrote what I did down at the bottom is that I was once giving a seminar uh, and, and, and Werner Ploberger was in the audience and at the end he came up and he had written this down on an envelope and said Wilhelm Busch and he gave it to me and he said this describes what's going on and I said great and so I started putting this on other slides and then one day I went to um, uh, uh, Washington University and Wilhelm Neufeind was in the audience and he raised his hand and immediately said it's not Wilhelm Busch 
and there was a long discussion about who it actually was. There were some other Germans there. We're not going to get sidetracked by that. What's the point of this? The point is, is that if you're a, a, a tagged individual, then you just look at the direct cost, and that's the end of the story. And that is in some, that's set by the parameters. It's really very, and that's all there is to say about it. Okay, uh, so all of the action is figuring out in this model what untagged individuals are going to be, um, and here is the first result. Um, uh, an equilibrium exists. Every population equilibrium uses monotonic, and that's what I call these things, population equilibria, not competitive equilibria, uses monotonic reservation strategies. Um, there's virtually no randomization that goes on. Um, and furthermore, um, theorem two, is the interesting theorem having to do with the compar so-called comparative statics, although it's really comparative dynamics. For every vector of parameter values, the set of equilibria are totally ordered okay, by this being more criminal or less criminal than. Okay? Um, so there will typically be, or often be in the examples I've worked out, there are multiple equilibria, but these equilibria can be ranked in terms of how criminal they are, and if you remember my definition of what it means to be more criminal. Now, um, in a situation like that, there's going to be a most e criminal equilibrium and there's going to be a least criminal equilibrium. Okay? And one way of discussing the comparative statics when you have a set of equilibria is to say how do the extremes move. Okay? And the way the extremes move are, are, are described here. If I increase in the sense of first order stochastic dominance, if I make criminal opportunities more lucrative, the extreme equilibria become more criminal, right? If I um, uh, increase the discount rate so that I care less about the future, right, and the stigma costs that I'm going to bear, equilibria, be the extreme equilibria become more criminal. Um, if I shrink down the cost function, equilibria become more criminal, right? And if I decrease the direct cost of being criminal, okay, equilibria become more criminal. And you would hope this would be true. The model would be bad if it weren't true. Okay? Um, and this is what turns out to be the case. Now what's more interesting to talk about, um, you'll notice that I haven't talked about, about the parameter g, the rate at which people get untagged. Okay? Um, and I also haven't talked about q, the, the, the probability of being apprehended. Right? And these are more complicated. I'm going to spend my last two minutes um, uh, talking about that. One can compute a long-run distribution. And um, uh, 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 so we have a stochastic, we have this Markov process that's going on, right? And one of the questions you ask about a Markov process is what is the long run, what does the invariant distribution look like, right? If I were to kind of draw at random, what am I, you know, one incident for what am I going to see, okay? Um, well, the Invariant distribution, the long, which describes the long-run behavior, in some sense the time average behavior of the process, that has the same properties that I've described. I can also construct the crime rate. I can compute right, what the crime rate is going to be for any given level of number of people being tagged. And I can ask, how does the crime rate change as a function of the parameters? And again, it moves in the same direction that I've described before. More criminal equilibria lead to higher crime rates. They lead, more criminal equilibria lead to um, an invariant distribution that puts more weight on criminal activity. Okay. Um, so if we talk about the number of people being tagged at any given minute, there will be more people being tagged, more people tagged at any, at any given amount of time. Um, so other things that you might look at in the stochastic process that I've described, other comparative dynamic questions behave the same way. Um, now getting uh, to the, and this is the last point, Rachel. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> what about the effect of increasing the untagging rate? So you know, for example, that if you commit a sex crime in this country, you're tagged for life. Okay? Does that have a big deterrent effect or not? Right? Um, there are a lot of, you know, and, 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 and so more generally, so you might, there, there, are, there are two effects that are going on if we ask what's happening with respect to the rate, to the duration, the 1 over g is the expected duration of a tag, okay? And what happens if we change that duration, if we make the expected length of being tagged, the expected stigma penalty very, very long, or if we really shrink it down, okay? Um, and uh, so on the one hand, if we increase the untagging rate, 
You might say, well, gee, people have to bear the stigma penalty for a shorter amount of time, and so that should increase the crime rate. Okay? Um, and that's kind of the, what you would um, think would be going on, right? But on the other hand, if we have G being very l large, right? In other words, we're going to have, a dead, in other words, the expected length of a penalty, I'm sorry, if we have G being very small, the untagging, let me say it the right way. I said this the wrong, I meant to change this, right? You know what I mean, right? If people are, if, if, if we're going to, if we're going to, if, if we're very slow at untagging people, then most of the time, right, we're going to have a lot of people being tagged and therefore the stigma costs in any, we're going to be living in that part of the cost function where no one's, where there's not a lot of cost, okay? So these are offsetting and now the question is, well, how does it balance out, okay? And the answer is um, that, um, uh, uh, you can, uh, you, you can think about what happens if there's, if there's, if there's uh, no tagging at all, okay? And it turns out that if you want to look at something like, like the crime rate, if there's no tagging or if tags last forever, you get the same amount of crime because ultimately everybody's going to be tagged, right? So in the long run, it's going to be the same. And in between, right, the amount of crime um, is, actually going to go, is actually going to go down because it's in the middle regions where tagging actually makes a difference. Right? So it's going to look U-shaped. Okay? And I even have a picture. Um, uh, I, I computed an example. Um, uh, and um, I'll just tell you what this picture is. Um, this is the probability of committing a crime. Okay? And this is the, the, uh, the parameter G. And in this example that I described, that I didn't describe, that I skipped over, um, uh, there are three kinds of criminal opportunities. One which is so good you're always going to do it no matter what. Okay? Another one that you're never ever going to do. Okay? And then there's a third one in the middle where it depends upon what's going on, how many people are currently tagged. Right? And so what are our equilibria going to look like? There's going to be a, for, for that middle one, for the, first, for the, for the top two, for the for top and bottom utilities, you're not going to do, you either are always going to commit a crime or never commit a crime. For the one in the middle, there's going to be a switch point. If, you have, if there's enough utility, you'll do it, otherwise you won't. Okay? Um, what I've done here, actually, uh, I guess, um, so what you can see is that what, what, what turns out to be the case is that, is that there's a range of, there's, a, there's an interval of utility levels and, and for every, everything in this range, for every utility level in this range, there'll be an equilibrium where that's the switch point. And now the question is how do the switch points change? And they change exactly like this. They go down and then they go up. They go down and then they go up. Okay, so, so we now have more complicated comparative statics and what this suggests that, if, that, that I don't want to suggest that one could actually optimally tune stigma, okay? But if you want to ask what, is, what kinds of social norms turn out to be most effective at diminishing, um, at, at, at deterring crime, it's going to be norms that are, 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 are not too weak and norms that are not too strong, but norms that are kind of in between, where by strength, what I'm talking about now is not the cost of the stigmatic, of, of bearing the stigma cost, what I'm talking about is the duration of stigma, okay? So it might not be a good idea from the point of view of deterring crimes to say that once you have been incarcerated for a crime, you can never vote again, right? Or that you can, you, you, you can never get a job because you sit in some database forever, right? That probably is not a good idea, okay? On the other hand, of course, it's not a good idea to say we don't care, okay? Um, it's somewhere in between um, that has the big effect. I've already talked about what's missing. We talked a lot about that at the beginning. We're done. So let me just show you three pictures that will describe the evolution of social meaning, which is the topic I'm really interested in with respect to adultery. Um, so uh, this is actually a picture from a film poster from 1932. Um, uh, um, uh, and, 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 and again, you can see that, that in 1932, the way, we thought about adult, the way we thought about adultery and stigma is what is the effect on her, right? The, the protagonist of the novel, okay? Um, and, and, and we don't really care much about what's going on in the community. Here's a poster, actually this is a book cover from um, a, another version of the Scarlet Lever published in the 1950s. And you see now that the meaning of adultery has changed, okay? Because... You know, here we have this poor woman who's suffering, but notice now how, how we seem not to like the people in the community anymore. 
Okay, so so we have you know we have these women you know you can see this and here we have this really smug face you know like eh, right right this is this is this is exactly the people you were talking about earlier that's her right and then here's a contemporary meeting from 1995 Demi Moore <laughs> thank you <laughs> adultery is fun yes. 